Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about money um, and more importantly we're going to talk about the functions that money plays in our macro economy and we'll look at um, what it what the definition of money is and what separates um, one piece of colored paper with a picture of somebody on it from another piece of paper that's colored with a picture of somebody on it because uh, one is money and one is not and uh, we'll talk about the impact that money supply has on aggregate price levels We'll talk about how to measure money supply, and there's two different measures we're going to talk about, M1 and M2, and we'll be able to distinguish between those two, and we'll be able to calculate the total money supply um, given data in a table. All this information is in Chapter 30 of your book, and the pages are listed there. So first thing is the roles that money plays. What, it, what does it take to be money? Another way of looking at that. And something is money if it... If it uh, embodies three different characteristics. One is that it has to serve as a medium of exchange. And by medium of exchange, I mean it has to be accepted for the purchase of goods. So it's something we have to use to buy and sell goods with. Um, and having money as a medium of exchange makes trading easier because I no longer have to barter. It eliminates the need to barter um, different goods with each other because now I have this one thing that I call money that I can use to purchase anything that I want. Without money serving as a medium of exchange, we do have this barter system, and the only way for bartering to work is to meet what's known as the double coincidence of wants, meaning in order for me to trade with somebody else, the person I want to trade with has to have something I'm interested in, and they have to be interested in what I have to offer for trade before any kind of agreement can be made. Otherwise, we need to go to third or fourth parties, and, uh, and the transaction becomes very difficult and very complicated. But with money, I don't have to go find somebody else. I just carry these things around that we all agree is a medium of exchange and I use that in order to make a purchase. Money also needs to have, uh, has to serve the purpose of being a store of value, meaning that it needs to last a long time, that it shouldn't um, degrade uh, over time or rot or in some way um, disappear. I should be able to get paid in money now and be able to spend that same thing called money later. That's why things like paper money um, and more importantly like coins do a great job of serving as a store of value because they don't lose their shape, they don't lose um, significant weight, they last a long time and so therefore they serve as a strong store of value. The last characteristic is that it should serve as a unit of account. And by that I mean for something to be money we have to um, be able to express the price of goods in terms of this thing that we call money. So in our system we talk about things being priced in terms of dollars. And so um, that works as a unit of account. Um, we're not comparing it to other goods so we don't have this complicated um, system almost like bartering where you know a, a, um, a pound of butter is worth two cows or four chickens or three eggs it's just stated in terms of a single uh, currency as the unit of account so for illustrative purposes we'll look at a couple of these we'll do more in class but but if you're talking about something like salt, which has sort of been used in the past as a, as a form of, of trade, does it serve well as a medium of exchange? Uh, is it a store of value? Is it a unit of account? Um, in today's world, it is, it's not a, a medium of exchange. No one accepts salt anymore for the purchase of goods and services. We don't need it um, as much as they may have you know, back in the, in the uh, 1400s. Is it a store of value? No, salt degrades over time. If it gets wet, it gets ruined. Um, is it a unit of account? Are the prices of goods expressed in terms of the amount of salt? No. So salt is no longer a form of money where it might have been in the past. Cattle falls in the same category. You know, Again, people used to use cows in the past, but are they a medium of exchange today? No. Are they a good store of value? No, cows die. And finally, is it a unit of account? Again, no. Nothing is expressed in terms of the number of cows necessary in order to purchase something. So that doesn't count towards money. Gold, on the other hand, is a little different. Do people accept gold in terms of exchange? Yeah, sometimes people do accept gold coins, for example, in, in terms of exchange. They would serve the purpose of medium of exchange. 
Does gold store value? Yes, it doesn't degrade quickly over time. It's going to be around for a real long time in its, in its general shape and size. Um, and, and gold is denominated in dollars, and so that would form a unit of account. So gold would act as money in our modern system, whereas salt and cattle, which were used in the past, wouldn't count today. We can talk more about this in class, but I just want to give you a little sense for, for the difference um, between different types of, of goods that have been used as money in the past. The next question we want to ask ourselves is, what effect does the amount of money in our economy have on the aggregate price level. And to look at that, um, I want to propose a, a uh, theoretical auction. In this theoretical auction, we may be offering uh, goods that people are, are interested in. And if we all had uh, single dollar bills, you know, if all we had were dollar bills and everyone had $10 to their name in class, and then I offered to you an iPhone 5, or I guess nowadays it's iPhone 6 or 7 whenever you're watching this. Um, then you know we can only buy we can only pay as much as we've got and so the price for an iPhone 5 if all we had each of us had were a hundred one dollar bills would be relatively lower than if I were to say give everybody a hundred five dollar bills because you can see a situation in which the auction would get higher because we have more dollars to our name and so what we find is that um, when we increase the amount of money in the macro economy the value of that money uh, begins to drop and the prices of goods um, tends to rise. And, and so we know that increasing the amount of money causes prices to rise because of increased competition and more resources available to us to bid up prices for goods that we want. The question also is how do we measure how much money there is in the macro economy? How much uh, money is there in the money supply? And to do that there are generally two different definitions that are used to measure how much money there, there is in the economy. One is called M1, which is what we call currency and circulation. And so that's cash and checks and traveler's checks. Anything that can be used right now to buy something is considered part of M1. So dollar bills, coins, um, and checking accounts are, are the most common. Those are things we can use right now to buy stuff. That would be considered M1. M2 is going to be all of M1 plus what are called near monies. That is things that could be converted into cash quickly and easily. And so M2 generally includes our savings accounts because you can't use your savings account to buy anything. You have to transfer money from a savings account to a checking account in order to purchase goods and services. Um, certificates of deposit, which uh, we should have talked about in the previous class, are is uh, money that you put in the bank for a period of time that is contractually agreed to and that you can't have access to until the time is up um, so the bank can lend that money without fear of you coming back and asking for it and so they're 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 able to be converted into cash but not at, not immediately and so they fall under m2 and then there are what are called money market accounts which are, are like a CD uh, in that there are limited withdrawals but it's like a checking account in the sense that you can write a check against your account but it's because there are limited withdrawals it's not quite M1 and so it would fall under the category of M2 and one way to look at it because a lot of times what you'll see in AP uh, macro tests in particular talking about money supply is if M1 changes what effect does that have on M2 or if M2 changes what effect does that have on M1 so one way to look at that kind of problem is to think of them as concentric circles um, and so M1 is a subset of M2 so anything that increases the amount of money in M1 by definition has to increase the size of M2 anything that increases the size of M2 on the other hand does not necessarily mean that M1 is getting bigger if we're adding money to savings but not into checking or cash then M2 is larger but M1 is unaffected if we move money around within the circle it also doesn't have an effect on on, on anything so if I converted uh, took a check and then cashed it then I haven't changed the amount of money in M1 because I just transferred it from one form to another and that means that I also haven't affected anything in M2 because there's been no change and so 
the best way in my mind to be able to try to keep track of what is the effect of a change in the money supply is to keep track of if the money change is an M1 change or an M2 change. If M1 is changing, M2 has to um, by definition. And we're going to practice this a little bit in class, so um, it'll be a little bit clearer, I think, as you look at your problem sets. Hopefully those problem sets will help, and I look forward to seeing you in class.